Well, actually, in the really old days, a PhD was a, a disadvantage. Why? One, because it was a German invention, you know, and, and slightly um, suspect, therefore. OK, so this is the situation. I've got to mail in the PhD to Yale or lose my job. Wow. Um, or, or, well, I don't know. You, you know, uh, some people would have fought it, but I, I didn't have the connections with people to really fight it. Uh, and I, temperamentally, I, you know, uh, I didn't have much published apart from, apart from a few reviews. Uh, so it would have been difficult. Uh, anyhow, I got the PhD. I'm in the post office. This is the last possible day I can mail it. And I see that there is a wrong character there. <laughs> so what I did, you know that on the blocks of stamps, there is an edge to the yes. blocks. I got a bit of the edge, pasted it over the character and wrote the correct character and then mailed it. But that's how close run it was. That's what they did in Dunhorn. <laughs> Often on manuscripts. Uh, pasting over. Pasting over and writing over on the yeah. pasted paper. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's, that's interesting to know that. Um, yeah. Which is also what they did with, um, you know, repairing woodblocks. You know, they can yes. dig it out and put a plug in. Yeah. Which is why, you know, people assume that um, woodblock is very clumsy because if you mess up, you've really messed up the whole block. No way. And in fact, if you think about them putting plugs in uh, to substitute for wrong characters, you're on the way to having movable type. Exactly. If you, yeah. if you put too many plugs, then it becomes yeah. basically movable yeah. type. Yeah. Though it's interesting that Tangut seems to be maybe the first i think the evidence is it still the evidence that tangut is the first with move, movable type maybe the first dated yeah kind of thing yeah. yeah 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 interesting yeah um, very much so but i mean there's no evidence that they are the ones who invented, invented it. it no i i think it's probably soon but 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 but, yeah. but um but they had more incentive to use it um because they probably haven't got as much wood as the chinese have Maybe, yeah. You know, for example. Um, yeah, because they used, like, clay. Yeah. I don't know when metal types came in. The Koreans seem to like metal. Yes, yes. But one chopsticks, more... also. <laughs> yeah. uh, chopsticks, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There must be a lot of metal in Korea, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we don't. Or, or, or that maybe they just like a, it to look tough. Or you use gold or something. I mean, that one. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what happened in Cambridge? So how long were you here? I was right here for a dozen years. A dozen? Twelve years? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and there were some good students. Um, I don't know how, how you find the Cambridge students. Um, oh, I, my, you mean undergraduate? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, my... Brilliant. The impression that some people have is that Cambridge students um, tend to be self-satisfied because they made it to Cambridge. No, I, I didn't think so. Not in the case of people doing Chinese because they've made a deliberate choice. Yeah. It's the same with SOAS. The, the SOAS students are okay because they're not just drifting into university because everybody else is going to university. You have to make a conscious decision, you know, to be a SOAS student. And also in SOAS you get all these guys coming in on MAs who, wow, we, you know, we've been teaching English in China and we realise this is actually quite an interesting country. Did you go to SOAS from Cambridge? Yeah. Why did you make that move? Because I had kids, you know, I needed more money. You so know. they offered you more money at SOAS than... As a, pro as a professor. I see. It was a vacant professorship. Okay. Uh, uh, and the, um, and I had nothing on, on, on my... Um, CV. I mean, uh, some quite extended reviews, but nothing substantial. But I did have uh, good references, you know. Uh, in those days, it wasn't tick box, you know. These days, I'd never have got it because uh, the administration is far more objective, and so you have to fulfil all these desirable and uh, have a book out. Uh, yeah, and all, all this kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's terrifying. Um, you may know there's a guy in Buddhist studies called Paul Harrison. Yes. 
Richard Lynn said he was he taught a class in New Zealand once consisting of Paul Harrison and two other guys and they were the most brilliant students he'd ever encountered anywhere and he's taught extensively in the USA and Canada and wherever. So the next time I saw Paul Harrison I said Richard Lynn say that you and a couple of your buddies were the most brilliant people he ever met anywhere. What happened to the other two? And Paul said, and I think this is very sad, well, one of them got went into administration. And, you know, um, there's an infinite amount of administration and in some ways, you know, it's a, a reasonable option because you, uh, you know, you're not knocking yourself out all the time trying to yeah. do research. And he said, and the other one got uh, chewed up and spat out by the tenure system. In other words, if you can't make it with that book or whatever, however brilliant you are, you're out. I mean, this, this when I started, there was nothing like that. Van der Loon and one or two other people didn't even have PhDs. Uh, and, and Van der Loon never published a book till he retired. So I asked a friend of mine who was um, not in Chinese studies, but all, was in a similar situation. Um, why did they manage to get jobs if they if if they got no you know nothing on the cv and he said well actually in the really old days a phd was a, a disadvantage why one because it was a german invention you know and, and slightly um suspect therefore and the other because if you're in a very small field like asian studies you should have a word of mouth reputation you know, and it doesn't really matter um, uh, what what's on the published record, um, and that's the way it worked. You know, um, so I think I benefited from that, and I, I you know, I'd be hopeless today. Um, no job, no nothing. I should imagine, but uh, as it is, I managed to you know kick around being third town person, and. Um, one of the specifications in SOAS was that it had to be somebody who knew Japanese because I was supposed to be in charge of um, um, experts in Japanese hist history as well as Chinese history. That's why Bill Beasley, who you've probably never heard of, he was a major historian, but he, he probably had had a bit of uh, classical Chinese um, at some point. But his predecessor had left because uh, he said he couldn't, um, handle the um, all the languages required. That was uh, Charles Boxer. Yes. Okay, you know Charles Boxer. Yes. Amazing guy. Is it, is this the guy who was in the intelligence service? Yes. And his wife was Emily Han. Eventually, he was actually married to somebody else uh, to yes, start yes, with. Yes, she was his called uh, Ursula. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know this. He, yeah, he was in a Japanese prison or war camp, yeah. and uh, manages to survive. And and one of my friends says, yeah, because he had an American girlfriend, who was before Pearl Harbor. She was able to you know give him food, um, which explains why I, I only met Boxer about three times, but each time he said something absolutely memorable. And the one thing he said in relation to that was he went to, what's the name of the school? Wellington. Like, like my school had a very distinct profile, you know, missionary. Wellington is a military school, really, up and down. You know, you, uh, from there you go to Sandhurst. Um, he said to me when I said, um, um, oh, it must have been tough in the prisoner of war camp. He said, I had worse malnutrition when I got out of Wellington than I did when I got out of that camp. But he did have a little help in that camp, so uh, don't think too badly of Wellington. Uh, okay. sounds, sounds like a hellhole, um, or was. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, Boxer... Yeah, she talks about him. There's the, the Emily Hahn, China, China, China to, to Me. China that to was me. banned in Britain for many years. Oh, I didn't know that. Because it, it revealed that a, that a British officer was having an affair with, see, with, see. With, a foreign, okay. with a foreign woman to boot. Yeah. Um, so it was simply not published uh, uh, in, in, in Britain for, for many years. Well, I read it here in Britain. But I guess yes, but it was much later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Check the date of your um, edition. Cause it's a new. It's a fairly, fairly new. Edition. It might be nineteen eighties, but no, no, no. It's like the last five, six years. Yeah, yeah. It did came yeah. come out in the nineteen eighties, but yeah. it, but in the nineteen fifties, it was not available because it would have been bad for morale. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
yeah so boxer um uh, knew some japanese um but the thing was he was a military man and uh, saas in those days um was big on african languages um which are now almost extinct they had lots of african languages because there were lots of retired missionaries who could teach them you know and indeed missionary recruits who needed to learn them uh, or, or district officers you know the empire was just fading at that point you know um, but there were still chaps who needed to know uh, chui or whatever so the staff common room was full of ex-missionaries and boxer always expressed himself like a military man in sort of barrack room language so the mission ex-missionaries found this rather uncomfortable and and let it be known uh, this according to a later colleague of mine at so so boxer decided that he'd probably better go to king's college where there was a chair of portuguese rather than hang out with all these types in so so that's what he did so beasley got the job um, um, but Beasley, nominally at any rate, um, was covering both China and Japan. In fact, he had a guy, was it Gavin McCormack, who did a very interesting book about Manchuria. Um, uh, they uh, went, uh, may have been Australian by origin, but went, went off to Australia. But it's about uh, Jiang Zulin and all that kind of stuff. Well, Beasley was a supervisor. You know, you had to be able to spread yourself a bit. Sars being cheap would not have a professor of Chinese history and a professor of Japanese history. So I knew enough Japanese to bluff my way with that. Fortunately, they didn't ask a Korean because uh, that would have absolutely floored me. You know, the, um, and a Korean wasn't taught here either. So I had no means of picking up. It was in Oxford, yeah. which means that Peter Kornitsky was able to pick up some okay. Korean as a Oxford student, you know. Um, but yeah, not, not a word of Korean um, was part of Cambridge education until after I left. What about Manchu? Was it ever taught here? No, although there's some material in Manchu by Wiley uh, in the library. Yeah. But, but I don't. And so maybe, I don't know if Giles knew Manchu or, 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 or um, um, Moore, but, um, or indeed Wade, I don't know. But I don't know that it was ever taught here. Um, it's taught now in Saos, as you may know. Yeah, well, Peter Kornitsky taught it a little bit. Did he? Yeah. Well, he did like reading groups, text reading groups. Wow. Yeah, just before, shortly before his retirement. Yeah, well, well, Lars Lahman teaches it in, in SOAS, as it were, um, off the record, you know, because the idea of having a class with less than 20 people in it is, is taboo in SOAS these days. So um, he just not, not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't know how long that's going to last, but yeah. but um, and it was fine in so as to start with when I arrived. You know, this has only come in in the past decade since I quit. I quit a little ahead of time. You know, um, it was clear the way things were going. So as therefore allowed me to spread myself in a way that I found quite congenial. That I'd have students coming in who were really very good but they were doing modern Chinese history I was in a sense responsible for them but uh, fortunately I had colleagues who could really cover research supervision um, Charles Kerwin to start with who was an expert on the Taipings uh, Charles was entirely disillusioned and therefore only appeared on Friday afternoons briefly and, and, uh, and stayed out of so I saw as long as possible but then I got Gary Tiedemann who was wonderful um, didn't play the uh, play the game correctly he would spend years on, on something like a bibliography uh, which only appeared when he retired which meant he was never promoted so um, but he really knew his stuff and so I could pick up people like Frank D. Kurter, uh, Robert Bickers and so forth and though I was um, nominally in charge of them uh, and it was interesting to talk to them because they, they're both good historians in different ways um, Gary was there to sort of back me up and actually teach him useful things uh, and then all, all kinds of people showed up but um, <laughs> nobody much in tongue history uh, uh, or, or, you know I'd, I'd give it a go supervise any, uh, anything I, I, I 
when I was retiring, I was still supervising a doctorate on the Chinese poetry of Natsume Soseki. Ah, okay. Very interesting, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, if I wasn't going to supervise it, nobody else would. Um, fortunately, it was somebody capable of putting stuff on their own.